You are watching CIO TV by Enterprise IT World, a production of Accent Info Media. For all those kind of transformations, you need to be talking the business language. And so I think we need to update ourselves to be able to talk that business language if we really want to become IT leaders. Uh, welcome to CIO TV dot live. Uh, this is an uh, uh, this is a production of Accent Info Media. Today uh, I have a special guest uh, from healthcare IT. His name is Mr. Jalil Rahman, Director IT Prime Healthcare Group LLC UAE. Uh, let me give a little bit uh, background of uh, Mr. Rahman. Uh, he is a collaborative leader with Kin vision to understand business challenges and opportunities. He takes on the duty of delivering reliable IT services and ensuring data integrity and information security across the global IT infrastructure. Prior to joining uh, Prime Healthcare Group, he was part of the British pharmaceutical company, uh, mainly Glaxo uh, Smith Klein, where he held key positions, uh, namely solution delivery manager, Head of uh, end user services uh, in Middle East and South Asia, and IT infrastructure manager, Gulf and Near East. Mr. Rayman is also a former head of IT operation and infrastructure as well as systems administrator at Abu Dhabi, Abu Dhabi National Insurance Company. Throughout his career, Mr. Rahman achieved numerous milestones, including the development of long term IT infrastructure strategy, introducing uh, uh, introduction of scalable and global mobility strategy and implementation of a mobile device management sub solution. In his career, he has received many accolades and the most recent one uh, is COVID-19 Superhero NIA Technology Awards. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure talking to uh, Mr. Jalil. Uh, welcome to CIOTV.live. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Okay, my first question is, uh, being in a healthcare industry, you must have faced a lot of pressure. How have you managed, monitored, and made technology available to the IT users in your organization? Of course, you are into healthcare where IT users, IT enabled users are more than direct IT users. Yeah, I'm sure. I think in the healthcare and COVID uh, was at the peak or when it really you know, broke out uh, for this part of the world. There were couple of challenges. One was um, the back office, like the contact center and you know, many other the insurance department, uh, IT as us and finance, you know, allowing them to work from home. Uh, it was one of the one of the key things. But uh, for, for the other part of it, it was the doctors. The doctors, you know, who had to come to clinic I and mean, they don't have an option to work from home uh, because the patients might come and also the COVID, you know, suspicious patients might come. So how do we, you know, what, what help do they need it was another, another area. So on the area where the back office had to work from home, I think that was the uh, easier part for us because uh, a good piece of our IT is based out of India. You know, there's offshoring as well. So there is remote working already available. So we just extended that to our, you know, the rest of the organization, um, especially the contact center. We were very happy to say that in a very short time of three, four days, we were able to have the entire contact center work from home. So any patient call going into the contact center, they could attend from home. This also meant that they could work for longer hours because the calls were higher uh, because of the fear and people wanted to inquire more. There was more calls coming in, even though the patients coming to the clinic and the hospital were very less, but the number of calls were very high. But uh, allowing them, the contact center people to answer calls from home, made sure that they could spend extra hours at from home instead of you know driving or commuting by metro or other means to the to the to the you know office they could stay at home and be on the call so they were able to give more hours and that actually made up for the extra resources required the same applied for finance it all of us were working from home um, and and we had uh, tools uh, we were fortunate that we were quite ready because we were one of the first uh, microsoft teams adopters when they launched teams uh, end of last year we even had our uh, you know training for our staff uh, beginning of this year, even before COVID. So we're quite ready with the virtual working. People are all ready with Teams and the Teams accounts. So everybody could attend uh, meetings from their mobile or from their you know, company laptops, or even from their home PCs if they needed to. So this was, was one area. 
The other area where the doctors had to work, um, there were certain areas where we could help the doctors, especially in uh, patients who were on ventilators. Instead of having the nurses monitor them regularly next to them in the room, we were able to provide them remote monitoring, you know, where the camera and other uh, features were provided, where they could sit at a central console and look at the patients who were ventilated. Um, even though we didn't have the, too many numbers at our hospital uh, in ventilation, but there were few. And, and, the, and the risk to our own staff, especially the nurses who need to spend a lot of time next to the patient, was high. So we were helping them by, you know, uh, allowing them to monitor the patient remotely and, and no need to stay next to the patient all the time, not just the patient, the readings that were coming from the patients. Um, so that was another area. The third area where I think uh, mainly for business continuity and, and for the patient reach, the patients to um, be available, you know, for the services to be available to them, we were also the first to roll out telehealth in this region very quickly, you know, within a, a seven to 10 days time, we actually rolled out telehealth for our patients uh, where they could actually take appointments with the doctors um, and, and doctors could consult the you know, patients could consult the doctors sitting at home. Uh, and uh, the prescriptions also, we, you know, because we have a fam, you know, pharmacy chain, we could also deliver the prescriptions uh, to, the, to the homes you know, so that patients really didn't have to leave the homes. So the, the two months where we saw a total uh, lockdown, um, you know, this was a service that really helped our patients a lot. So I think these were the areas where IT was able to quickly, you know, um, pull up our uh, socks and provide you know, those services which is really required at the right time for both the organization and the patients. All right. Were you ready for this situation? Uh, because because what happened when the COVID situation happened till now also it is continue, uh, continuing that you are uh, the healthcare IT uh, leaders they are given. MDM kind of solutions uh, or telemedicine kind of solution in the hands of the doctors and nurses. Yeah. Were you ready? What was your infrastructure like? Was it uh, ready to manage, ready to support the extra yeah. burden of IT? We were, in, in, because uh, I wouldn't say we were totally ready, but there was some preparedness because we already had a digital uh, you know, uh, direction or digital roadmap. It's just that we had to speed up some of those. Uh, and and uh, so when you talked about providing doctors access, we already had a mobile app for the patients more than you know two, two years back. And last year, uh, mid of last year, we had launched a doctor's app as well, where the doctor could see uh, not the full uh, electronic medical record, but a lot of details, including who the patients are, you know, uh, who, who they have a schedule for today or the next day, uh, as well as any critical alerts in terms of labs, you know, the past uh, history of the patients in case they need to call the patient and tell them some information. Even when the patient doctor is not at the clinic, they have that access to it from their mobile app. So we were ready in that terms. And as I said, you know, from collaborative working in terms of teams, we were ready with that. Um, and, and it was, that helps us to actually train the doctors, you know, whenever we made any changes, because one of the key things during this time is the collaboration and the communication. You know, how frequently you're talking to the entire staff, updating with the new reviews, updating with the new you know, requirements, because things were changing almost every day, uh, if not twice a day, right? So, uh, so this was, uh, the, the need of the hour was actually communicating to entire staff, including the nursing and the doctors. And with the tools like Teams and other collaborative tools that we had, you know, the mobile apps, you know, it was easy for us to actually co collaborate and, and communicate to people and, you know, even call for a training if required. Uh, where everybody could attend, you know, wherever they are, using their mobile or their PCs, because uh, we we already had the tools for it. All right. So as you are saying that you have already jumped into the band bandwagon of the digital transformation. So where are you now in terms of your digital strategy? Uh, where are uh, you now as far as customer experience is concerned? Yeah. So I think there was some of some learnings out of this uh, telehealth that we've been running now. We saw a huge volume during the, the times when there was restrictions. After the restrictions uh, eased out, um, we're still seeing telehealth being done and home delivery of medicines being done, but the numbers have gone down. Um, but that's still happening, and because there are, and we also extended. So there were some learnings uh, in terms of. Uh, the adoption by the patients itself, because earlier it was seen as, will this work? And you know, patients will still prefer to come and see the doctors. Doctors also had a little bit of hesitation, but all that was made very clear, black and white. You know, they could really see the benefit of it because they used it, and and, and it was a situation that they really wanted to use the service. 
and the doctors are also quite convinced the capability of telehealth. Of course, not every uh, kind of case can be done over telehealth. There are certain which doctors will need to examine the patient, and that you know the doctors will tell the patient that they need need to come to the clinic. But a lot of them, especially chronic patients who are following up for their medication refills, and you know just to have their regular revisit to the doctor after the three months or the four months that they need to be seeing the doctor, this was very convenient for them. So there's a lot of these chronic uh, patients actually opted for this and doctors are also very convenient you know for doctors also it was quite convenient even uh, we had it was also a video call not just an audio um, so even derma doctors saw it quite uh, you know easy to use in front of because there was video available they could show them the you know the skin conditions or other things so there some of these you know departments really appreciated it so this was uh, one part where, so the, the learnings from that, we extended that even during that time uh, to even provide drive-through vaccines, right? So we saw that children were delaying their vaccines. There were concerns for parents, you know, when do we take it? So we actually extend that, that into a drive-through vaccine where all the formalities of the payments and the consent forms and many other things can be done sitting at home. And once everything is ready, they just have to come to the, the clinic and we provide you know, provided one facility which had a drive-through. They could drive through uh, because of the regulatory requirements. They can't take the vaccine in the car, but it was just a facility that they just have to step out of the car, you know, take this step back into the car and go. So that was a very convenient thing, which we extended later. And, and that's being used by pediatric patients quite a lot now. So taking all these learnings, we are taking it to the next phase. We have a project now in, in place. We are looking at the patient experience. You know, there could be a lot more things which we can actually improve the patient experience by digital. So what we're doing currently is looking at the entire patient journey, each stages of the touch points, and trying to see if how many of this can be done digitally. Do we really need these many human touch points? Can it be those digital touch points? So these, this is an exercise we are doing now. We're fast forwarding our uh, digital transformation in terms of patient experience. And uh, we are hoping that very soon we'll have some new services and new you know, in, in experiences for the patients, which the patients will definitely appreciate. All right. Hospital or healthcare industry is such a place where, where the surge in, surge in demand is very elastic. Sometimes we'll have more patients, sometimes less patients. And this situation, COVID-19 has been one of the uh, learnings, one of the examples of that surge or you know, going flat, actually. So uh, your back end has to be very ready. Now, there are, there are talks happening that most of the organizations are becoming digital organization. So that means uh, you need to have elasticity in your data center to serve the front end. Uh, so cloud is one of the tenants. Uh, so are you, what is, can, you, can you take me through very quickly uh, through your uh, data center, uh, is it on-prem, outsource, or in cloud? Yeah. yeah. So as I said, you know, when we started this digital journey around two, three years back, when we started planning for it, the first, you know, one and a half years, what we spent was on the infrastructure. So there's quite a bit looked at the infrastructure in terms of the data center itself, in terms of security. These were the two, two main things that we looked at, you know. Um, so we did put certain... Uh, you know, policies as well as certain features in place in terms of security. And we did consolidate our data centers. So we were purely on a in-house data centers. We had two of them. We consolidated that into a single one. We also started going into a hybrid um, um, bit of some of the services went into the cloud, started with mail, but there was also, you know, public cloud on some of the workloads were moved, the lighter ones were moved onto the cloud. Um, and also internally, we brought in everything together into one data center. We bought everything together to one infrastructure, a consolidated, you know, um, I wouldn't say hyper-converged, but it was a converge, except for the storage, everything else is a converged into one uh, hardware with VMware. So internally, we were running our own cloud. The data, you know, IT ourselves were running our own cloud where we could spin off a virtual server as and required uh, by the business. Uh, and we also extended that to uh, the cloud because we started using cloud, public cloud for certain services. So we did have certain smaller workloads on the cloud. That was a few years back. Uh, this year beginning, we also started a bigger project moving one of our main workloads into the cloud as a managed uh, service on the cloud, uh, which is still ongoing because that had a bit of a delay because the goal I was during the COVID time, we delayed that because we didn't want to impact the business. So we delayed that to the end of the year, we will be going live 
uh, into that uh, as well. So yes, we are in, in um, kind of a hybrid and that's our journey as well. We'll, we'll still have certain things on, on prem for some time um, and, and we'll be looking at uh, you know, those ones which needs to go into the cloud for the benefit that of the business or either the functionality or the cost both from both perspectives. All right. If you have noticed uh, these days, most of the headlines are coming IT, especially IT related, related headlines coming uh, larger organization being breached, being hacked by such kind of malware. Now, many of your uh, IT workers are working from home. So what was your uh, strategy around uh, security as to uh, enable them a secure workplace uh, at the same time securing the endpoints, which are the entry points into your data center. So, as I said, you know, when we looked at security from a few years back, keeping in mind that there is, you know, we are on the path of the digital transformation and digital is a bigger piece to any business. Um, we, we, looked at, we looked at our security. So we didn't look at security at that time from a perimeter concept, which was a concept before, you know, security of perimeters. We looked at it from saying that people, you know, perimeter is where your endpoint is, right? Um, so we had to look invest in endpoint security, which we did a few years back. We, and as I said, we do have, um, you know, with, especially with an IT people working from offshore, from India specifically. Um, so we had to secure all those points. So we are, have those endpoint securities. We have all the other, you know, different security mechanisms in place. I wouldn't say any place is 100% secure. I mean, because it's it's always a race between you know, the hackers and, and protecting your environment. Um, so we have been doing that incremental investment, whether it be endpoint security, whether it be web security, whether it be the, uh, the, the firewalls, the monitoring of our, you know, network traffic, um, including uh, NAC. So we have a NAC in place, you know, which ensures that even the physical, you know, ports are not, you know, if you plug in and you find one network port open and plug into it, you know, it will not work because these are, you know, controlled by NACs and things like that. So there are a few things that we have put in place um in terms of security and that is an ongoing journey i don't think that's a one-time activity as i said you know they get better and wiser uh, and, and we need to actually upgrade and you know be on our front foot all the time so that's something that we have to keep um you know, updating ourselves so that's what we've done we've not really looked at the security from a, a defining a fixed perimeter we have looked at it by you know both access level controls um, you know, who needs to access what, so need-based access instead of, you know, even if somebody is coming into our network, you know, everything is not open for that person, right? So, you know, you need to look at things from that perspective. That's that's what we looked at. That's how we looked at security. All right. Now, the other thing comes that in UAE quite advanced, of course, in terms of implementing uh, the newer technologies, but what technology, the technology that I'm going to talk about or discuss uh, with you about is uh, robotics or RPA kind of things, uh, even humanoid uh, robots. Now, many of the organizations in your competition have also installed uh, robots on their counters, uh, you know, in their pharmacy, in, um, uh, uh, in the reception as well to guide, assert the patients into their designated areas. So two questions I have. One is that have you got any kind of uh, uh, RPA in your place which uh, automates your backend, uh, your you know, uh, healthcare uh, ERP kind of thing, where the um, uh, you know the database gets maintained. So, uh, do you have that that RPA kind of thing at the back end, yeah. at the front end also? Okay, so on the back end, when and when VAT started here a few years back, you know, and and you know, every invoice had to be looked at in the VAT cal calculation and the VAT submission. There were certain requirements from the finance. So instead of you know uh, um, giving that extra work to one person or adding a person into the, the team, what we suggested was an automation there. So there we do have a bit of an automation in terms of, I wouldn't call it a, a full fetch RPA or a bot, but it's, it's something very similar to that where you know in a bulk all invoices are scanned, uh, once scanned, the the you know there is a matching of the invoice number with our internal mm -hmm. you know finance GRN numbers and automatically posting into our you know, finance system, and then so that whole workflow and everything uh, is done uh, is automated. So it's it's an auto, there's an auto indexing and everything that goes on. Um, to to answer your question in terms of RPA, to extend that, we, this this year we've been working on certain use cases of RPA, both in uh, not only in the back office, but also in the in the 
uh, user facing side of it or the I, should, I would say the patient experience side of it as i said earlier there are some, there is a project that we're working on which is mainly focused on patient experience and there's a bit of rpa that we want to you know use over there as well um, so there is there is some work going on i wouldn't say that there's a full rpa implementation as of now but uh, we would be having something very soon and what about uh, bot services and the front end for the customer facing uh, uh, you know, no, we we are not. There are, like you said, there are certain pharmacies implemented robotic pharmacies uh, and and those sort here. But uh, no, we have not done in our our uh, organization so far. You are uh, planning uh, and also doing uh, projects within, and you are you are about to make certain projects go live very soon. Um, this is something uh, you can advise me or advise uh, the fellow CIOs or a, a director of IT or IT heads as to how to manage their budgets. So uh, there has been a challenge from the challenge of getting budget out of the C uh, C uh, CFOs and uh, CEOs. So how are you managing? Are you also facing kind of challenge? It is It is always a challenge, right? It's uh, There's definitely a challenge. I think the best way to look at it is the value that IT is providing to the business, right? You need to really put it in terms of value, whether it be security, whether it be you know new projects. As long as you can demonstrate the value value that IT is bringing back on the table in terms of the business, um, you know, you can get the right budgets. I wouldn't say you'll get all the budgets that you want, but you can get the right budgets. Um, so it's, it's about how do you show that value to the business and not really talk technical and, and go overboard with the technical terms that you'd, you'd normally talk in IT. So I think that's very, very important. Um, and, and, you know, when you talk about high availability, you know, when you start talking about high availability, um, you know, it might be too boring to the to the business as well as to get the right budgets, it might not. But at the same time, when you tell them, you know, can you afford to have no operations for four hours? What's the loss of your business if you don't operate on four hours? Do, do you need a system which, you know, if it fails, the second system comes up within, you know, five minutes, or are you okay with a four hours downtime where this is your business loss in four hours? Is that risk, you know, acceptable for you? Then you get a different answer. Then they'll say, you know, you, you know, we can't accept that. That's a bigger risk. I, I don't want it to be four hours. Maybe I can manage half an hour. Now, if you tell them to manage for half an hour, this is the cost that we need to invest. Then it, it, it's clear, and and they would most probably give you a budget if that's what they want. Otherwise, they would say, no, I can I can manage that, you know, two hours or the four hours, right? So that's the value that you need to put put in terms of what is the value the high availability is delivering to the business. Similarly, when it comes to any any project, and I'm talking about patient experience, you know, what is the value that this is bringing in you can't just tell them that you know bring in an rpa and and uh, you know uh, this is a budget i need for rpa you know i need to tell them okay this is the business process i'm going to look at this is the value that is going to add in if i do this this kind of automation and for that this is the budget i need and with that budget you know you would have rpa you have would have many other technologies right so i think the 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 fault we all go into is you know put the technology in front and try to discuss with the business for the budget you know, talking about the technology. I, I, I don't think that should be the approach. The approach should be, you know, talk about the business processes, talk about the value that IT is going to bring into the organization uh, and, and, and what, at what cost, right? Then, yes, there will be a fruitful discussion and there will be a fruitful outcome in terms of a budget allocation. So that's, uh, that's what I would say, yeah. Okay, I understand your point where you are coming from, but are you thinking that... Uh... Uh, most of these CIOs or IT leaders are putting two hats. One is that IT leader, the other one is uh, business leader because trans there is a big boundary between yeah. the two. No, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And I, since you asked me, you know, what is the you know advice for the IT leaders? I think this is what I would say. I think you need to really get into that space because if you're doing only the technology leader, then that is that is uh, I don't think the kind of you know leaders that organizations are looking for today especially with digital transformation happening right because it, that is an easier part if you are looking at only you know having a nice mail server or having a you know a data center or you know the, the required databases for you there are it vendors who will do that as a managed service and that's much easier to manage these days uh, you know you might not really need an in-house capability for that yes you need the technical know-how to manage that uh, but I think if you really want to play the role of transformation and play the role of an IT leader in an organization, be, uh, because especially because you know technology is doing a lot more value add than before uh, today, especially with, with this COVID times. You know, you talk about 
uh, working from home. You could talk about, you know, a lot of process automations, you know, uh, companies have been uh, getting rid of the old, uh, you know, uh, uh, systems that they have want and they want to you know modernize their systems just because of what they've seen with the corona and the challenges that they've seen with you know not being physically physically able to come to office so for all those kind of transformations you need to be talking the business language and so i think we need to update ourselves to be able to talk that business language if we really want to become it leaders all right so i think you you gave a very good piece of advice to the IT leaders, do you have any special advice to the healthcare IT particularly? See, yeah, healthcare IT, I think all of this that I said is, is, is valid, but on top of that, I think the complexity of healthcare is much more than any other industry um, because there, there's so many pieces uh, that we need to take care of, you know, whether it be especially, and, and, and secondly, it also depends on uh, which part of the world you are because the regulations are very different and the way insurances and other things are done are also very, the healthcare part of it, the clinical side of it remains the same, but, you know, the operational and the regulatory part of it, um, it will differ from country to country. So I think, uh, and, and the complexity is, is really very high because there are multiple players here. You know, there's one part of it, the payer, which is the insurance companies who does a pay, especially for markets like UAE, where majority of the, you know, the customers are having insurance policy and our major business is from the insurance and the payers are the insurance companies. Um, so they have their own control and they have their own, you know, way of controlling the market and, and their own requirements. Then there are the regulators like here, the Dubai Health Authority or the Ministry of Health and every, every government has that. And then, you know, there is also the, um, you know, so there are these two and then the, your own internal, you know, other controls which are there. So I think that's the complexity that healthcare brings in. Um, you need to look at it from specific, your own organizational internal view, uh, as well as the regulatory view. I think that's quite important when we, when we look to talk about healthcare. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jalil, for speaking to CIOTV.live. As always, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me on the show. Thank you very much. Thank you.